And so now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Chris Goebel um, is of the Monmouth College Communication Studies Department. Chris has a master's degree in speech communication from Eastern Illinois University and has taught at Monmouth since 2004. He keeps very busy advising the college radio station, the college MCTV television station, and the student newspaper, The Courier, you know, and also teaching, right? Although um, Chris has been a comics enthusiast from a very young age, this presentation is directly related to a very popular course he is teaching this semester at Monmouth College. Great power, great responsibility, superheroes, philosophy, and identity. It's a course in the general education sequence that allows juniors to reflect on their place in the world. And the course emphasizes the discussion of how popular culture heroes like superheroes can teach us a great deal about what we as a society value and can help us understand ourselves better. And I can't think of a better way to segue and pass things on to our speaker, Chris Goble. In the words of Superman, take it up, up and away, Chris. All right, thanks, Anne. Um, uh, uh, I'm really happy to uh, uh, talk to everybody tonight. Um, uh, superheroes have been a big part of my life. Um, if you can see behind me, um, I'm in the geekiest room of our house. Um, that's uh, the, our office room that has uh, tons of different memorabilia. I've even decided, I don't know how well you can see, I'm wearing my uh, uh, Black Panther hoodie um, to kind of get in the spirit of all of this. So when it looks like I'm kind of not dressed up, I am sort of in a uniform as well. Uh, but uh, as a kid, uh, superheroes were kind of an adventure, or this fun thing, someone to look up to. But then as I got older, um, you can start to really see the meaning behind these and what behind comics and it becomes more than an adventure. It's a place where you can learn a lot about who we are um, and uh, the things that we value and what um, we can really learn from uh, these narratives that are created or ostensibly created uh, for kids. So uh, when Anne started talking to me, wanted to do this um, display and talking about what we possibly could do, how we could examine comics, things we could uh, work on, I fell back on what when you ask me and I'm forced to choose who my favorite superhero is, it comes out as Superman, even though any comic book person who's sitting here listening, that's the hardest question. You can ask a superhero person what's their favorite. It's like, you know, picking your favorite kid. I have one, which makes that answer easy. But for others who have more, that's not you know exactly a very easy question to answer or hopefully not. Maybe it is for you. Um, but uh, falling back on the old adage that tends to attach to Superman truth justice in the American way, we hinged on that as a way to structure uh, this exhibit. So um, I wanted to start us taking a look at um, the exhibit and talking about what the big idea was with um, the pieces and parts of this exhibit. And then I wanted to hone in on a couple of ideas inside our thought process with justice. Um, and when comics try to engage in a little bit of activism and try to teach somebody something or get them to think about uh, something that's happening inside society. So um, uh, to begin here, um, I took some pictures of the exhibit when we were putting it together and I thought um, I could just orient you to what we were thinking and then hone in on this justice idea. So when we think about truth justice in the American way and think about how we can look at comics I thought truth really could go to the fact that, you know, comic books and lots of literature, uh, but some people don't think about comic books this way, that it might be trying to show us something about who we are and what's truth in society and how they try to show us that truth. And in and working on the exhibit from comics finally being able to try to tell truth about drugs and violence, which was barred for years because of the comics code, uh, to uh, trying to talk about contemporary issues like uh, women's liberation and from the famous or infamous issue of Wonder Woman that's literally called the women's lib issue from uh, the 70s uh, where they try to tackle this topic but do a fairly poor job and got a lot of uh, flack for it. Two more recent comics with uh, Ms. Marvel, Kamal Khan who's a Pakistani American teenager with superpowers 
and uh, when Northstar, um, an X-Men character, uh, was married in the first uh, gay wedding um, in comics attended by basically almost the entire pantheon of uh, Marvel heroes. So comics trying to tell some truth, trying to reflect actual society. And then the second part, we wanted to look at justice where comic books try to go out and teach us something or highlight and show how we could make things better um, in society. Uh, where well, X-Men was a good example to start this with because X-Men really are a metaphor and created in lots of ways for a metaphor towards um, uh, racial injustice. The mutants being that oppressed people that others hate just because they're different to the topic I'm going to spend more time on, which is the direct confrontation of uh, racism and bigotry uh, that superheroes have done. And then the final part of the exhibit, we looked at the American way and how comics have been a big part of popular culture, how popular culture eases its way into comics, um, like you can potentially see in this picture. Uh, Muhammad Ali and Superman teamed up at one point in time in a story to fight an alien um, who came to uh, Earth. Or when Barack Obama, when asked who his favorite superhero was, he said Spider-Man, and they put him in a Spider-Man comic. Um, or to the gigantic pop culture influence that the Batman TV show had in the 60s, um, where I uh, get, to do, get to flex and show my autographs from Adam West and Burt Ward when I got to meet Batman and Robin um, in person. But all of these things um, show instances where comic books go beyond just kitty stuff and go beyond just uh, fun adventure and actually try um, to say something uh, about our world. And when I was telling my students in class today, because I'm teaching the superhero class right now that we were doing this uh, uh, talk tonight and I invited them to come and I saw a few came in, what I was going to talk about, I said, well, I'm going to talk about the connection between Superman and the Ku Klux Klan. And um, I got this really, really interesting look from a couple of students and kind of a shock, but there is in reality a connection, um, not a connection that's bad, a connection that is actually good, where Superman actually takes on the Ku Klux Klan in very early in the 1940s. So what I wanted to do was kind of set the stage for where this came from, tell a little bit of the story of how we got to the point where Superman was taking on the Klan and how this story resonates through to today. And then another instance where a hero takes on this direct racial villain of the Klan. So let's set the stage here a little bit for where um, this is coming from and where this early instance, and as far as I know, and as far as I've been able to tell the earliest instance of a comic book superhero engaging in what we would call direct activism towards a social issue, um, like really, really a direct connection here. Um, I could be wrong about that, but in everything I've looked at, this is the, really the first instance I know of and I've ever been able to find. But let's set the stage here a little bit. When we look at America post-World War I, uh, the Ku Klux Klan had a real resurgence. Um, and you can see it in a lot of instances. One biggest glaring pop culture instance is D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. I don't know how many of you have ever seen this film, uh, but this film really is um, a film that glorifies the Klan. Um, it, it shows some of the Civil War and then Reconstruction, and basically it paints Northern carpetbaggers and former slaves as the villain and the Klan as the saviors of um, the South. And this was uh, a fairly well-held belief for a lot of Americans, because they do estimate in the early 20s, there were about 5 million Klan members in the national organization at the time. Um, and they had rallies. These are some pictures from a march that happened in Washington um, right around that same time. Um, so the Klan had resurged and was seen as basically just another civic group. So, you know, not much different than, different than the Kiwanis or the Lions Club. It wasn't seen as this insidious racial group, even though it was, but the general population didn't see that. They saw this sort of... Uh, um, benign public face to this civic organization. Now the Klan did actually go in a really solid decline in the 30s and 40s and actually the national organization disbanded in 44, mainly because it didn't pay its taxes and was getting uh, uh, pursued by the government for not paying taxes. So the actual national organization fell apart. But post-World War II, the Klan started to resurge pretty heavily in the South in particular and much more underground um, and much more violent. 
um, after World War II. And at this point, um, a man enters the picture and he's a young writer and activist named Stetson Kennedy. Um, some people who are folklorists or interested in folklore may recognize his name. He's fairly well known um, in folklore circles um, uh, as an author, but he was living in Atlanta um, in, uh, well, I've lost my date now, um, in uh, 1944, 45, he started to live in Atlanta. And he was seeing around him a lot of people that he was hanging out with, people he knew, and they were in the Klan. Um, so he got concerned about this. So he decided um, that he would just uh, go infiltrate the Klan. He would go join and see what was going on. Um, and also at that same time, the um, Anti-Defamation League was trying to get inroads into the Klan and trying to uh, find out what was going on and trying to advocate against uh, what was happening in the South. So um, Setson Kennedy starts to go to these meetings and starts to gather evidence. And it became very apparent to him very quickly that local authorities were not going to be the way to do anything. Because what was he seeing at Klan meetings? He was seeing sheriff's uniforms, police uniforms under white robes. He was seeing judges, city officials at these meetings. So um, it became very clear very quickly that he was not gonna be able to do anything locally. So um, he took another route and there's a route he goes to find his way to the Superman radio show. That's kind of interesting. And I wanted to play, I put some clips together. Stetson Kennedy this, uh, did an interview with the American Folklore Center in 2005. Um, and he talks about this as a part of the interview. The bulk of the interview is about his work in folklore. Uh, but um, he talks about his work and how he took the fact that he couldn't do anything with this evidence with local authorities and how that led him uh, to Superman. So I cut together some of this interview um, and I wanted to play it for you because this story is wonderful and I would butcher it if I told it myself. So let's let Setson Kennedy tell um, how he went from gathering this evidence from infiltrating the Klan, which he wrote a book about, but how he took this evidence and somehow he ended up, and somehow it ended up with the Superman radio show. So I knocked on the door of the FBI in Atlanta, and they showed little or no interest. And at that time, the FBI had six African-American employees nationwide, and those six were chauffeurs here in Washington. Uh, at the very next Klan meeting, the Grand Dragon gets up and says, well, I had a little call from the FBI last week and said, they're warning me that the Klan's been infiltrated and it, I'd better watch my step. Said, you can't ask for better cooperation than that. In desperation, I tried to get the House on american Activities Committee to take an interest. And uh, Rankin of Mississippi was chairman at the time, and he said, oh, well, the Klan's a, a patriotic organization. So it's just as American as apple pie. And eventually I took my large briefcase and stuffed it full of uh, evidence against the Klan, so much so I couldn't even close it, it was sticking out of the briefcase. And came up to Washington and uh, got in the back of a cab and started putting on my Klan robe. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the cab driver, of course, saw me in the mirror and, and I had... <laughs> We almost crashed, and, and <laughs> so I had to hurry up and explain to him what I was up to. And he put me out at the house office building, and I went in to the, knocked on the door of the Un-American Committee, and all the little ladies inside started screaming and, <laughs> and running, running out of the office, left me there, sitting there all by myself. And finally, uh, they sent up four Capitol Police appeared. I was flattered that they sent four. And I said, to take to take, to take to take me into custody, and they took me into the basement, and I explained to them what I had in mind. And, uh, they did not arrest me. They just told me not to come back in a robe anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, oh, but uh, this, having, all of that having happened, uh, uh, then I, you know, the first thought was uh, court of public opinion and the media, and my first. Uh, 
contact was with Drew Pearson here. And he, he wrote the Washington Merry-Go-Round column, which was a predecessor to Jack Anderson. I think Anderson was his office boy back in the 40s. Anyway, uh, Pearson, had, Pearson had a nationwide radio program. So we broadcast every Sunday the minutes of the Klan's last meeting. And with the names of all these uh, public servants and politicians and uh, businessmen, and lawmen. And the password, the latest password. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, none of those people ever showed up again. And uh, attendance generally hit rock bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah, the passwords came up uh, after Pearson. I went to Radio Superman, and they hired me as a consultant. And I would uh, telephone the passwords, signs and countersigns, things like uh, the sign would be white and the countersign would be man, or the sign would be native and the countersign would be born. Mm -hmm. So I would phone this into Superman. And so all the kids in America knew all the kind of passwords. <laughs> <And> just, <laughs> just as fast as uh, the Grand Dragon could think up new ones, uh, the kids would have them. And, um, the Grand Dragon went so far one night, he said, I might just, well, when I, as soon as I adjourn, I might just well go call uh, Superman myself and collect, <laughs> co collect that money myself. So what we see here is no, uh, no response from the government. So he decides to go to the media and first to a political columnist who had a national, Drew Pearson had a national radio show, then um, to Superman. And this isn't really the first time Superman, the radio show, had done a story centering around, let's not hate each other, let's try to live together, let's accept everyone. Earlier that year, they had done a story called the Hate Mongers Organization. It basically was this group who was trying to systematically destroy different groups or different people who were of different races or creeds. I want to play just a little clip from this to sort of set the stage of how we got to the story that Stetson Kennedy fed information to. Um, this is actually uh, a clip from the very last episode in the Hate Mongers, and it's Superman basically berating uh, the head of the Hate Mongers organization, giving him a talking to. We don't like people who push other people around. We don't like people who spread hatred and suspicion. I was only trying to protect America from foreigners. Go on. You know, America was founded by what you call foreigners. Right, Jim. Tell me, Hill, was it because you were trying to protect America that you told Muggs and his gang to set fire to Dave Hoffman's drugstore? Hoffman's a Jew. The Jews are trying to run the world. Hoffman's an American, regardless of his religious preference. Besides, as I recall, that was one of Herr Hitler's favorite lines. What about little Danny O'Neill? He's Catholic and comes of Irish parents, yet you had him beaten within an inch of his life. That's a lie. I had nothing to do with it. Of course not. Rats like you get others to do their dirty work. What about Dr. Leeds, a good Protestant minister? You almost succeeded in killing him. Is he a foreigner? You forgot Rabbi Stone. Yes, born and brought up in America, an honor student at college. Is he a foreigner? I'm not talking. You don't have to talk, Hill. The things you've done and the things you've tried to do speak for themselves. So the Superman radio show had already been dabbling in some of this. Um, and they they were a very they were an incredibly popular show. A lot of the things that we know about Superman, a lot of the things that we think are all the way back Superman lore came from the radio show, the Daily Planet and his boss, Perry White. That's not the comic book. That's the radio show. They changed the comic book because everyone identified that with Superman, the radio show. Jimmy Olsen was a construction of the radio show because they needed somebody for him to talk to. He needed a sidekick to talk to. So all these things that we hold with Superman came from the radio show. So it held a pretty central part to uh, who the audience understood Superman as and was very popular. So Stetson Kennedy came in and the producers and writers developed this story called the F Clan of the Fiery Cross. And it centers around um, Jimmy Olsen, Superman's friend, who is the cub reporter. He's an assistant manager of a baseball team. And the current pitcher, Chuck Riggs, um, gets beat out for the job of pitcher by a new kid that's come in, Tommy Lee, who happens to be Chinese American. And in the first game, in the first practice, um, Tommy accidentally hits Chuck with a pitch. Chuck gets upset and goes home. Um, he's talking to his uncle, Matt. Um, his uncle, Matt, convinces him that 
the kid did it on purpose. And Matt's already upset because he knows Tommy Lee's dad, because Tommy Lee's dad is a bacteriologist who got a big cushy government job that he deserved, but he's Chinese American. He shouldn't have got this job over other Americans, which is what Matt Riggs believes. So Matt convinces is trying to convince him that this was on purpose and it was totally um, Tommy trying to take him out. So Matt takes Chuck to a meeting. So we're going to drop in on episode two as Matt takes Chuck, um, his young nephew, to a meeting. Carefully drilling his nephew to make him believe the false version of the baseball accident, Matt Riggs drives to the top of a hill, then turns down a rutted weed-grown road which winds between the trees. Suddenly, they come into an opening, and as the car stops, Chuck gasps at the strange scene before him. In a glade, casting weird shadows over the nearby hills and lighting the sky above, burns a huge wooden cross. Before it kneel half a hundred men clothed in long robes. Pointed hoods, slit only at the eyes, cover their heads and faces, and a low guttural chant issues harshly from their hidden lips, sending an uneasy chill through Chuck's blood. While the boy looks about him at the fearsome sight, Matt Riggs dons a robe and hood on which a pale blue scorpion is embroidered. Then, followed by Chuck, he approaches the kneeling hooded band, a strangely barbaric company in the dancing light of the flaming cross. Gosh, who are all these guys, Uncle Matt? And why are you wearing the sheets and hoods? We're the clan of the fiery cross, Chuck. The clan of the fiery cross? Right. We're a great secret society pledged to purify America. America for 100% Americans only. One race, one religion, one color. I don't get it. America's got all kinds of religions and colors. Mm, when we get through, there'll only be one. So here we are, episode two of this story. We are eight years old, about 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, and all of a sudden we're hearing a clan meeting with crosses burning and guys in hoods uh, and a kid there who is going to eventually be telling them what happened and now the clan is after Tommy Lee and his family. And this, as the story proceeds, uh, they start to terrorize Tommy's family. And Tommy actually gets kidnapped. Um, and Superman ends up helping to save him um, and uh, gets the Daily Planet involved. And Perry White, the editor of the Daily Planet, writes a scathing editorial and publishes it, denouncing the clan. And we're going to pick up right now in episode six. And it's Clark Kent, Superman. Jimmy Olsen and Perry White in the car driving back to Perry White's house after this editorial has been published. I thought I'd remind you. Well, I just got an idea for an editorial for tomorrow's paper, Mr. Kent. How about Wait a minute. Chief, look. Well, what's the matter? Up ahead, on your lawn. Well, gee whiz. Good, good Godfrey. A flaming cross. <laughs> Their eyes wide, Clark Kent, Perry White, and Jim Olsen stare ahead at Perry White's lawn, on which burns a wooden cross, symbol of the dreaded plan of the fiery cross. The cowardly men of hate and bigotry who stalk at night, anonymous in their robes and hoods, have dared to warn Editor White that he is next on their list. So, here we go. This is KKK 101, Fear and Intimidation. If someone's crossed you, if someone's come out against you, you burn a cross on their lawn to show them you mean business. So here we are in this kid's program, and Perry White has a burning cross on his lawn after publishing this editorial. And it doesn't really stop there. They continue to go after Perry White and Jimmy Olsen, and they end up capturing them and holding them captive um, in a barn. And at the same time, Chuck, our kid who innocently told his uncle everything that was going on, has started to have second thoughts and is actually trying to help now. Um, and let's drop in with one more clip. It's in episode nine, and it's Perry White and Jimmy Olsen captured by the Klan um, talking to Matt Riggs, uh, their captor. You and others like you with your diseased minds want to tear down what we've built and fought to keep, but you can't do it. Blast you. I'll Blast. fight you to the last breath. And so will every other American worth his salt. We'll flush you and your hate-peddling goons out from behind your dirty sheets and clap you in jail where you belong. Atta boy, Chief. Now, put that in your pipe and smoke it, Mr. Rat. You fools. Do you think that you or anyone else can stop the clan of the Fiery Cross? You bet we can. And we will. We stopped Hitler, mister. And his outfit sold the same baloney as yours. All right. 
I'll just show you how we'll deal with those who stand in the clan's way. Joe! Yeah? Tell the brothers to start heating the tar. Get those feathers ready. What? Tar and feathers? Jim, easy. Look, you're mad. It might kill him, you know. After all, this old goat is no I kid. don't care who he is or what he is. Do as I say. Okay, you're the boss. All right, so tar and feathering. Okay, now the show didn't go as far to do a lynching, but they were getting pretty close to what was pretty common tactics um, at the time of fear and intimidation and torture. And they're putting it into a kid's program. And all these kids are hearing this and seeing this as this incredibly villainous thing. And they're, they're bursting the bubble around these kind of practices and actually putting them up to some sense of ridicule. Because just imagine, you know, you're a clan member and your kid is listening to this and is pretending to fight you this would have had this incredible like impact potentially hopefully on these parents but on these kids to see the insanity of this sort of activity their hero is saying how horrible all of this stuff is that their parents are potentially have been involved in and are a part of and they even go further in this not to do too many spoilers but in later episode, not right around this, Matt Riggs is talking to the above boss, above him. And that guy's saying, hey, what are you getting so worked up about? This is just about making money. I'm just in it to sell, uh, you know, memberships and robes and wooden crosses. What, what are you getting? Why are you getting so concerned about this? So they actually even bust the bubble here and minimize it even more by saying that in reality, this is all just supposed to be a money making scheme. Um, it's a con. So they even diminish it further. And that and doing this sort of thing really pulls power away. If you can make ridicule of this, if you can shine a big light on it and show how ridiculous it is, it can really start to pull power. And I think, you know, um, the Klan must have known this because there's tons of reports of Klan leaders denouncing the show and trying to uh, um, boycott, calling for boycotts of Kellogg's. Kellogg's was the sponsor. In particular, a cereal that doesn't exist anymore, Pep, was the sponsor of Superman for years. Um, it's super delicious. That's their slogan. So I've never had Pep, but I'm sure it is super delicious. <laughs> Jim's giving me a, 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 an A-OK, so I'm sure it was super delicious. Um, but Kellogg's, there's never any indication that they ever questioned this. In part, this series of episodes was a crazy ratings boost. This was hugely highly listened to. Um, but the show is incredibly popular, so Kellogg's was never going to abandon this show, no matter what um, this group thought or if there was some boycott, which there's conflicting reports of there actually ever was a boycott. There's talk about it and there's rumblings of it. But this series of episodes from the late 40s have resonance beyond this and continue to be thought about and talked about. Like one example, um, in 2005, um, in an episode of This American Life uh, that's called Know Your Enemy, um, in the opening segment, you know, Ira Glass usually talks to somebody and does a very like tight, small story to introduce the idea. So in this uh, initial opening segment, he's talking to a, a Stephen Donor, who's the author of Freakonomics. And there's, they start talking about Stetson Kennedy and the Superman radio show and how this, you know, uh, used radio to shine a light on this idea. And Ira Glass closes the opening segment in, in this way, and I'm going to quote this for you, in referencing the Superman show and drawing a direct line to what they do on This American Live. And here's the quote. It's wonderful. So I, I'm quoting here. So quote, see, that's how you do it right there. You get to know your enemy. Then you put them on the radio as forcefully as you can, end quote. I mean, I think what this says is if you can really show who people are like, what they're like, and really push it out in front of people's faces and shine a light on it, you can start to burst some of that power. You can start to take away some of that mystery. And then they start to become less scary, even though they're still scary. But when you start to know them, it's less of the unknown. And a big question can come up today is there still resonance to a story about Superman directly and literally, because this is direct and literal, combating white supremacy and racism right now? Because so much times in science fiction and stories like this, it's metaphorical. It's some sort of 
here we're going to use this alien or this conflict to be racism. This is direct. He's literally fighting racism. And this is this very question in an interview on Polygon.com that was asked, asked of writer Gene Luang Yang. And just in 2019, he wrote uh, for DC a three-issue miniseries called Superman Smashes the Clan, along with artists, and I'm going to mispronounce this artist's names, Jirohiru. Um, he's a pretty well-known artist in anime uh, arenas, if anybody's an Avatar fan. He's had done art in the Avatar books um, quite a bit. But um, Yang took the 40s radio series, Clan of the Fiery Cross, took in his own experience as an American-born Chinese, and wove in a retelling of this story. And I pulled some panels, some pages from the book that mirror the clips that we just listened to. The Clan meeting, the burning of a cross on the lawn, Superman saving people from the clan, you got Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, and they threw Lois in there for good measure um, in the actual uh, comic story. But when Yang was asked about this, um, he gave a really interesting answer to how this has resonance now. So I want to quote this too, because his answer, I think, sums why these stories are so important and how if we look at them, we can really see a reflection of the things that are challenging us now and why they're important things for us um, to talk about. And, and here's this quote, how he answered that, does this story resonate today? And I, and I quote, yeah, absolutely. I think it is white supremacy, but it isn't just white supremacy. It's also this real evil version of nationalism that we're not just seeing in America, but all over the world. I think right now there is this question of whether or not human beings of different groups can live together peacefully. I felt like after World War II, all the world had just gone through this horrific thing, and we were saying, yes, it's possible. And this storyline is about saying, yes, it's possible. And now it does seem like if you look at what's happening here in America and in India and in Europe and in the Philippines, it seems like people are starting to reject that idea. So a lot of the writing behind this is about exploring that. Can people who are different live together peacefully? And I think when you start looking at stories like this and others, you can see writers tackling this and we can begin to question this ourselves. You know, are we capable of this? And what will we have to do to be able to do this, to live together peacefully? And when superheroes do this, we're taking these icons that we put up here as examples and watch them deal with very much these real threats not some sort of alien threat, a real threat. And these, this isn't the only instance, and I'm gonna back us up a few years. So we can take the 1940s in Superman. There's another hero that faced the Klan in the 1970s. And it was an opportunity that Marvel took because Marvel introduced the real first black superhero, Black Panther. Um, and in 1976, um, writer Don McGregor uh, wrote a series of stories where he took the African king T'Challa, who came from very much an isolated country where he was king, um, and they were technologically advanced, better than everyone, and dropped T'Challa in the American South of the 1970s, and have him, has him directly confront racism and legitimately fight the Klan, to the point where they crucify him on a burning cross, and he's fighting a group of Klansmen um, in the South. And this was really groundbreaking and interesting from the fact of who might have been reading this and what this means. Uh, there's a book in the library called Super Black, and in it the author says that real race hatred now was the fodder for imaginary black superheroes, and racism was no longer symbolized by bizarre looking villains, but bona fide racial villains, real people. These heroes are fighting real people who are doing evil things not some sort of glorified supervillain. Um, and this could have, and I'm sure had a real impact. When I read this the first time, it had an impact on me. I was shocked and amazed. Well, I was amazed they were doing this story and shocked by how real it felt inside of a comic book. Um, and to kids who would have experienced this at the time, I didn't experience it at the time. I experienced it as an adult. But at the time, this would have been something really, really powerful. And I found one instance, um, Tom Cade, he's the owner of Challenger Comics, Games and Comics in Georgia. 
he was 12 when he uh, saw this story on newsstands. And his take on it, I thought, was really interesting. So I'm going to quote one last thing directly. Uh, but this is too good not to quote, too. Uh, so, quote, during this time period in the 1970s, as a young black kid growing up in the South, the KKK was very real to me. The KKK was something to be feared. They were hosting cross burnings on top of Stone Mountain. It was real and it was terrifying. So when you had a character like Black Panther taking it to them, you were like, hell yeah. Even a comic book character doing what needs to be done helped to calm some of our rage. It allowed you to function in the world without being worried all the time. So I think when these positive images and these heroes can be fighting things that we are challenged with, it can have a lot more power. Um, it can help to make us feel better, or at least feel that this is not something unconquerable um, and see the world as something that can be, if not fixed, made better. And it can have such a powerful influence on people who can directly identify. And I think you see that even today with the impact of the Black Panther film and then the subsequent death of its star, uh, Chadwick Boseman had um, on fans from i don't know how many of you saw this after his death the kids who were legitimately having black panther funerals with their action figures i only picked two but there are tons of these where kids were crying having funerals uh, for their hero and then also um when the black lives matter movement started to pick up on and use wakanda forever and the actual uh um salute as a part or a rallying cry of this, of their movement, of the Black Lives Matter movement. So these figures can have resonance into real life and they can have an impact on people. Um, and in part, that's what the class that I teach is about too, trying to find that impact and find what we can learn about um, ourselves uh, through these comics and through comic book heroes, tackling and fighting real life villains or real things or real villains that uh, we might uh, be faced with. So that's what I wanted to talk about from the exhibit, but I'm happy to talk about anything else or any questions people might have or anything else um, that occurs to them. Those episodes of the Superman radio show are available online. You can find them on YouTube. Um, you kind of have to fast forward a little bit because they're sectioned around 15 minutes with only about seven minutes of story and recap and ending. Um, so their pacing is a little weird if you've never listened to something like that. But that set of shows is really worth listening because it's so different and really so groundbreaking for the 1940s to even think to do this um, and legitimately put real clan stuff on the air is crazy. I, I, it, it was, <laughs> for lack of a better term, it was, it was very ballsy of them to do that in a kid's show um, and done really well, too. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. If anyone has a question, um, you're welcome to either type it in the chat and have Sarah uh, read it for you or um, just indicate you have a question in chat and unmute yourself. We don't have any questions in chat yet, so feel free to dive in, folks. You can just unmute yourself <laughs> and go for it. Oh, Mark has a question. Mark, go ahead. I'm just curious when Chris came across these old um, 1940s Superman comics, how long ago he did. Um, I, I read comic books. I talked to Chris on the side uh -huh. about comic books back in the day, and I just read them just as a kid to look at them and um, I would have, even if in 76, I don't know if I could have comprehended the Black Panther one. So just curious. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it all honesty with this, I, I listened to the Superman radio show some when I was younger, but really the, the clan story, I didn't uh, come across until maybe 10 or 15 years ago um, in starting to do like more research and interested in Superman. I just came across this story that there was this clan storyline in Superman. And I'm like, holy crap, I've never, I've never heard that before. Um, so I started researching and finding the radio show and listened to it. And I'm like, oh, this is crazy. I don't know how they did it. 
or how that and then i found this then i found deeper into the story about stetson kennedy and how it all kind of came together and it becomes this like amazing moment of where real life and a real purpose comes into the superhero world and the superhero can actually have like a really good impact um on a group of people i mean this is so big this is silly but this event has been talked about and seen so big. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Comedy Central has this drunk history show where they take people, they get them drunk and they tell history stories. It's really funny. It's stupid. They did one on Stetson Kennedy. They did one on this. Um, and it's really stupid and funny. But I mean, this really has had like a long term kind of impact on people, um, whether they even experienced it, you know, when it happened or not. Um, and the stories come up over and over again. Um, but yeah, I was much older uh, seeing that. And the Black Panther story the same way. I mean, I, I didn't see it. Um, Black Panther wasn't a book that I read much when I was a kid either. I knew who he was, but um, I was much older when I started to um, get into and start reading more Black Panther um, and found this story too. And I'm like, oh, wow, they, they've crucified him and they're burning him on a cross. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is edgy for the seventies too. <laughs> We have a question from Lindsay. Lindsay, did you want me to read it or would you like to ask it yourself? Um, I'll go ahead and read yeah. it for her. Okay. Uh, Lindsay said, what are your personal feelings on Superman smashes the Klan and how it relates to society today? I mean, I think um, there's, there's, some really practical things it did and then like storyline things. I think it's a wonderful set of three stories and they did it the right way because um, they used an, a basically a, a manga artist um, to visually tell the story. And that resonates so much better with a large scale of a younger crowd. So the story can get to a whole new group of people. Um, and I think uh, on the story wise, uh, even though they tell it in a past context, um, I think it does resonate because I think so many people um, are seeing these groups pop up again, are seeing a lot of people who seem to hold these viewpoints, whether it's large groups or small groups, um, that this kind of story where you take a hero that people admire and someone who they look up to, um, who they think is uh, someone who has the moral high ground, who is someone who we don't expect to do things wrong. And Superman is someone we don't expect to do things wrong. He may make mistakes, but we don't expect him to be on the wrong side of things. And when he's on that certain side of it, I think it gives you pause. It gives people pause to think about it. So I think it very much relates in the sense that this is stories of things that potentially are or could happen uh, today, even though told in a, in a past context. And the structure of the book, I think, just hits something that would resonate visually and storytelling wise with um, a uh, with a crowd today, with a younger crowd today, because of the visual style and the storytelling. OK, you got a shout out for your class from Alexis. Yeah. Uh, amazing class. Yeah. Highly recommended. And then Vicky asked, did the KKK ever go after Stetson Kennedy? You know, I, I, I have not read his book. I want to find it. I haven't been able to like find it readily. I want to go try to find that. I, I rode with the Klan book. Um, from everything that I've seen, not systematically by any means, because he ran underneath another name and this book came out late enough that um, he had separated himself, I think, enough from the situation that there was never any solid. As far as I know, and I could be wrong about that. Like I haven't intensely researched everything about Stetson Kennedy. Like I say, I want to get a hold of his book um, to read more about it. But he did most everything under an assumed name. Um, uh, but uh, he, uh, he, I think he separated himself a great deal from it after when he had written the book. And I think by the time he wrote the I Rode with a Klan book, he was really well established and somewhat of a known figure. So going after him would have been hard uh, to do, even though we might not generally know him now. Um, in folklore uh, circles, um, he's a pretty well-known figure. So I think by that point, he had enough notoriety that they wouldn't have been able to get to him 
uh, very well, but I don't know that for sure. Um, like I said, I'd like to get his book and read it sometime, but I haven't been able to find it or I haven't made, I guess I should say, I haven't made a serious effort to find it. I've gotten in, really interested in it lately and haven't had time to make a serious effort to go out and try to find it. I'm sure I could if I, um, you know, dug in and looked for it somewhere. Mary wondered if anime comics take on truth and justice themes as well. You know, I, I, I haven't read a lot of them either. Um, most of the ones I've read, um, I haven't seen um, a lot of that, either the ones from Japan or the ones from Korea, because um, those are the two major markets of, that produce anime and manga work. Um, now some uh, anime films have, and there are some really, really deep uh, films that have come out of anime in Japan uh, that do look at lots of different um, issues um, of uh, social justice and truth and all that. Um, but I don't know of any like actual comics and I'm, I'm not versed in it very deeply either. So I don't know. Um, there probably are, but I, I don't know of any off the top of my head that do. Okay. And then Matthew asked, Chris, what's your take on the irony of Superman being a true alien, being a leading light on the subject of being American? Sure. Nice to, nice to see your name pop up, Kurt. How are you doing? Uh, <laughs> couldn't turn your mic on. All right, that's fine. Um, um, you probably have screaming kids in the background. That's my guess. Um, the, there is some irony there, but I think it's what makes Superman so powerful that um, even though he looks like us, Superman tells a bunch of different narratives. He tells the true alien. He tells the immigrant narrative. He also tells the adoption narrative. He's all of those things, but yet this beacon, um, he is this like symbol of America or a symbol of justice. Um, and he truly is those things that sometimes people think aren't American. He's not American. He wasn't born here. Um, he, he truly is not like us, even though he looks like us. Um, so Superman is this, I think an amazing like mixture um, of all of these different ideas that can tell, you know, these interesting narratives. And it makes sense because, you know, the, the guys who created them were a couple of Jewish kids in Ohio who, you know, felt very much like the uh, downtrodden immigrants, you know, and they created Superman to have power. They created this powerful figure that would fight for them. And in the initial Superman stories, that's what he's doing. The very first issue is Superman. You know, he kicks the crap out of a, a uh, wife beater. Um, he takes on like a tenement slumlord and a corrupt government official. I mean, he's very much like a social justice warrior in the very first issue. And there's different times where that hasn't happened. But oh, yeah, he is this. It's irony, but I think it's irony on purpose um, because it is this like amalgam of all these things that we say we are. But sometimes we don't always admit that we are that we are this group of immigrants we are these people who are different and that's okay and here is our beacon hero who is very much not us or like anyone else but he wants to be which i think it resonates with every immigrant story chris uh i'm maybe the only person who actually literally grew up <laughs> with these uh these 15 minute radio things coming home from school 3 30 in the afternoon and spending awesome. the next hour or hour and a half while mom was making dinner listening to them and uh, certainly truth and justice uh was in there although i do not remember the particular superman episode that you mm -hmm. uh, that you note there uh, what i did popped into my head was another uh jack armstrong the all-american boy yep the uh, all-american boy yep who was uh, always involved in taking care of the the weaker uh the downtrodden and uh, that was the way you became all-american uh was by taking care of others uh and uh, and so that's uh certainly it runs through all uh, of those childhood uh, stories that uh, we hung on, literally. Uh, I, I know it's impossible for people to, to actually believe 
that you would do something like this, that you would come home and sit with your ear to the radio, uh, yeah. trying to uh, get with uh, Jack and Sky King and the Lone Ranger and, uh, and the whole uh, the whole battery of. Uh, I wish I, I'd also like to say that I would be a lot richer today uh, had my mother not. Uh, finally chucked out about 200 comic books uh, when I went oh. to college. <laughs> yes, you would. Because <laughs> I believe the last time the first issue of Action Comics sold, it sold for, I want to say, just under two million. And the first appearance of Batman just sold for like three and a half at auction. And so many, of the, and, and the reason why there's hardly any of them, because so many of those books went to paper drives during World War II. So no. parents like... <laughs> Just took the comic books. These are throwaways. And they they basically, these comics that are worth millions of dollars were blown up somewhere over Germany or Italy or Africa or Japan. Uh, <laughs> and there's just very few of them um, left. But you're right, Jim. There's this thread through a lot of, um, in particular, kid radio, kid radio shows at the time about, um, and in some comic book stories of about, if you don't treat people equally, it's un-American. They really draw this line of saying bigotry is un-American because we were going through that Amer American phase that would lead to some of the anti-communism and all this, lumping communism in with racism and all this. You get this solid thread of to think like that's anti-American. Um, and it's throughout all of them. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's through all of those narratives. Deeksa, did you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it for you? I can ask it. Let me just open the chat again. Um, is it safe to say that part of the reason that comics are so effective is because their audience tends to be younger? And are there ethical ramifications because of this? Um, I think in some ways, yes, it's, there's, uh, they are effective because the audience is younger and they're very open. Uh, you know, they're and and they're very they're very trusting uh, and revere the hero. So if the hero is fighting this thing and it's the evil thing, they'll be very quick to see the evil of it. And yes, I, I mean, I think it is true. There could be some ethical ramifications because kids do in lots of contexts see very black and white. And if there is gray to some of the subjects that are being treated as just good and just evil, the kid may not see the gray. Um, and you can see that sometimes, and I think you can see it too, if you look at some of the, in particular, anti-communism stories that were told in the 50s, that Marvel in particular has sort of just washed away. Because we they like to, Captain America, for example, they like to say Captain America existed during World War II, was frozen, and came back in the 60s. That's not true. There is a cross-section of comics in the 50s where... Captain America was a communist buster. And there's a lot of hate mongering and paranoia in those Captain America stories from the 50s around communism. So there's some ethical ramifications for sure to presenting that to younger audiences and getting that sort of paranoia embedded um, in kids, which is I think why Marvel likes to, Marvel has retroconned that a couple of times because actually at one point, that Captain America in the 50s was a replacement Captain America who they bring back in later and he's nuts and he's evil. So they sort of like wash that away by making the replacement Captain America in the 50s be a anti-communist nut when the real Steve Rogers is back. But they've generally just thrown that whole decade, decade and a half of Captain America away. It didn't sell well and no one really cared about it but they sort of have just taken that, pulled it out and went, no. Um, but it's not the only one. There were a lot of that going on. And you can even pull back further to a good amount of stories that were told that have really bad uh, racial undertones during World War II as well. Um, not necessarily vilifying, but just the representation in particular of Japanese. Um, there are a lot of really, really racist imagery in comics for kids and basically it's the stereotypical drawing of Japanese people um, that is really disturbing when you look at it today um, and does have effect you know and you can kind of see the long-term effect 
of how long and how for how long that continued stereotype can the flu through and continue to pervade media of how they treated um, people of Asian descent um, in characterizations. Uh, the same thing is true of uh, Native Americans and many other um, ethnic groups. But yes, there's absolutely these ethical ramifications that are there. Um, you hope that, and I, I, I hope that with this story, there's positive ramifications. But when you go with black and white, and that's what kids tend to see, you've got that gray area. And if, if, they, don't, if they don't get that gray area, and there's really a problematic gray area there, there's real ethical problems that can come later. I mean, what are, what are some of the other big classic kind of social justice storylines? I mean, the one that always comes to my head was uh, the, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow, hard traveling, when, when they get mm -hmm. a little pickup truck and drive across the Bible Belt. Yeah, in it. There's, a, there's a good number of them right before that. Um, and it's what kind of changed the comics code. Um, right, yeah. Uh, Spider-Man, uh, Stan Lee was approached at Marvel by um, the department. It, it, it's what, huh, before... For health and human services, it's what it was called in the seventies. Whatever it was, a, it was different. Health, welfare, and something else. Right, right. Um, they were approached to do a drug story. Well, the comics could said no. You can't right. do that at all. So um, they wrote this really good story where Spider Man saves somebody who's completely stoned out of their mind, and they jump off the top of a building. Right. And in that same story, Peter's best friend Harry Osborn is becoming an addict. Okay, so they yeah. tell this three issue story and Stan takes the story to their publisher and says, why don't we just publish this without the code seal? Right. So they publish it without the code seal. It sells really well. Schools start asking for copies. So then the comics code loosens it. And then you get the green lantern, green arrow story where speedy is a drug addict. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of them. There's, I, I have in the cabinet over there, there's a, there's um, an, it's really one of the earliest graphic novels that Marvel did for X-Men. It's called God Loves, Man Kills. Yeah, okay. Have you ever read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, that tackles um, the ramifications of religious zeal, zeal right. and because the main villain is a, is a televangelist who's preaching that mutants are devil. They are made by Satan, so we shouldn't treat them like humans. And there's these group purifiers going around killing uh, mutants. Um, and uh, I mean that's a big one there's a really good current book that deals with it woven into the story and it's Ms. Marvel because oh, um, with, the, with the, the, the new yeah I go in and out of like the comic thing like I'll, I'll be like really into it for like a two one or two years and I'll be completely out of it so that's mm -hmm. the that's the new uh, Captain, the, the uh, Pakistani teenage girl yeah right. and the, the original yeah. writer is Pakistani herself oh, okay. so she draws on some of her own experience um so it's both like a teenage Pakistani American just dealing with being, you know, Muslim and in the United States. And then all of a sudden she develops these superpowers, but she's a very like bright and cheery person. Right. But there's all this dealing with like the traditionalness of her life and being a freaking superhero right. and being damn excited to be a superhero, but having to try to hide it from everyone. So it's like, it's, it, but it deals with like, in a very, very fun way with what life is like for, you know, a Muslim teenager um, okay. in a really like fun way too, and not, you know, punching you in the face right. um, as well. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Just, I, just, cause I was just trying to, you know, it was like, in particular, I think that what you got on at the end there, like, are there any kind of current ones that are really kind of picking that up? Cause I mean, I can, I can highlight the things yeah, I remember once you mentioned, I remember, you know, the Spider-Man story and then mm -hmm. Speedy, where it shows up for like three issues. And it's just like, a, as you said, it just, it's just a slam in your face with it. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. all right, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All great questions tonight. Last chance, last call. Superman will be leaving the building soon. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to thank Chris um, so, so much for tonight spending time with us, as well as all of your hard work in the creation of the exhit at Hughes Library. Um, so, yes, a round of applause, first of all, for Chris. Thumbs up. Um, yeah. And if you're on campus, I'm, go see. I actually have a, uh, Jim, you'll be interested in this. I have a pep pen. I have a Superman pep pen that they gave out in uh, 
in the you could get box tops and inside the cereal they gave these little pins of all these different heroes and i have a superman pep pin and it's there so i bought it at an antique shop it wasn't vintage of anybody i knew i like oh i have to have this um but yeah there's actually an artifact in there from the radio show as well so that's a good plug to come to Hughes Library yes. and it's on the east side, main level. Can't miss it. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we are um, bidding you good night. Um, safe travels wherever you go. And uh, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, everybody.